time is um, the actions of the minutes. Um, so our first vote will be the action of the minutes of the open meeting, May 20th, 2020. So I need a motion. Does anyone have any questions about or? Um, Kathy, can we, can we do these all together or do you need them separate? So, okay, I have to do one by itself. Then I can do two, three, and four by themselves. Five by itself and then six. So you just said all, basically that's all of them by themselves. Or did you mean two, three, and four can be combined? Yes. Okay. And I, I trust you, if you need separate motions, we'll just start with one. I would move to uh, that we approve one. All right, so Dan approves the um, open, meeting, open minute meetings of May 20, 2020. Second. All right. Any corrections or anything? No? Okay, so this is a roll call. So Kathleen Howland. Yes. Uh, Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. John Frank? Yes. John O'Shea? Yes. Lauren Bailey? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Okay. So, Dan, you want to keep on going? I would. I would move items two, three, and four, the executive session minutes of December 7, 2019, March 18, 2020, and April 15, 2020. Okay. Thanks. So Dan Kalenda made the motion and Paul Buck a second. Kathleen Halland. Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. John Frank. A question. Are these being retained? Um or released. 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 Okay, yes. Um, Sean O'Shea? Yes. Uh Lauren Bailey. Abstain. Um, and all right, so Lauren abstained. Um, and Dan Kalenda. Yes. Okay. Kathy, I would move five, which is the action on subcommittee meeting uh, minutes for October 30, 2019, May 7, 2020, and March 10, 2020. I'll second. Okay, so Dan Kalenda made the motion. Paul Bucca, second. Um, Kathleen Halland? Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. John Frank? Yes. John O'Shea? Yes. Warren Bailey? Abstain. And Dan Kalenda? Yes. And Kathy, if I may, I would move that we approve the retained executive session minutes of September 18, 2019, October 16, 2019, November 20, 2019, and December 18, 2019. That's approved and released, Dan? Yeah. Yes. Second. Okay. All right. So Dan Kalenda made the motion. Paul Buck is second. So Kathleen Halland? Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. John Frank? Yes. John O'Shea? Yes. Lauren Bailey? Abstain. And Dan Kalenda? Yes. Okay. Um, so educational policy, there is none at this time. And then um, the first part of new business is to interview the candidates for vacancy of the North Borough um, seat that's available for this coming year. And Kathy, do I have this correctly that only the North Borough members would be voting? Yes. Oh. Yes. But any other members can be part of the of the interview that's process. That's the question. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Greg, is Karen with us? So Karen is with us. So welcome, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi. Just got um, to so unmute myself here. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. So I want to welcome you to our meeting. Um, thank you for applying for the vacancy for the town of Northboro. Um, and we just want you to start with um, if you can share your background and why you're interested in the position. Uh, sure. Um, I'm just going to read um, the statement that I prepared, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, sure. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I'm a 17-year resident of Northboro and I'm proud to raise my family in a district with such an excellent school system. I've been involved in our community and schools in a variety of different ways. Uh, I've been a member of the Peasley School Council. I've assisted 
Teasley grade five teams with a STEM grant for technology learning uh, back when my kids were in that school. I've been a T-ball coach for five years, a Northborough youth soccer coach. I'm a founding member of the Northborough Town Common Committee. And I've also been a workshop presenter at the Northborough Junior Women's Club STEM Summit for three years. I'm a former high school teacher and district school administrator. I know the various ins and outs of how high schools work, the schedules, the AP exams, the extra, extracurricular clubs and sports teams, great expectations, elective lunch schedules, bathroom passes or lack thereof, <laughs> senior privileges, pep rallies, and much more that comes along with being a high school student and or staff member. I have lived it as a teacher and now I'm reliving it as the mother of two teens who attend Algonquin. I'm seeking the vacant seat on the Northboro Regional, Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee as I truly would be an educated and informed voice for our community. I've attended our town meetings for many years and watched as the town manager and superintendents, Charles Gabron, Christine Johnson, and hopefully Mr. Martineau will get his chance soon. Um, complement each other and work in tandem year after year to bring fiscally responsible budgets to the town while still keeping educational priority, priorities that move us forward. I'm a strong advocate for, um, for I'm a strong advocate for educating our next generation of thinkers and doers. I'm a strong advocate for allowing and encouraging teachers to think outside the box and inspire their learners. In the last several weeks and months, we have seen that our educators and our students are capable of doing great things. I would like nothing more than to work with you, the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee, the administrators and teachers at Algonquin so that you can continue to do these great things and more. Um, so with that said, that's my statement. Um, I believe you have your resume in, and I think many of you know me <laughs> from past um, uh, interviews and, and times that I've been at, at, at meetings, so. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I, I do, Kathy. Okay, go ahead. Um, Karen, thank you very much for the time and that you've put into your application uh, to the school committee and also very impressively the work that you have done with the Northboro schools and also the town and attending the town meeting. So thank you very much. Um, you said that you were a district in your letter that you were a district administrator in the Dudley Charlton Regional School District. And um, if you could highlight um, a challenge that you had encountered in a regional district and what the outcome was. Sure, I mean, there's, well, I, I think one of the highlights um, that has really kind of presented itself and that we really kind of helped us come together over the last several months has definitely been the fact that um, we are regional school district, Dudley and Charlton, and we um, had some, we, we always have curriculum issues with not being able to kind of be in unison on where we are with our curriculum. Um, that's been highlighted for years. Our teachers struggle to always, you know, they want the individual, um, individualized approach, um, but with the, with COVID actually recently, that's been one of our greatest um, strengths is overcoming that and really kind of putting together one grade one lesson for, um, I was gonna say North or South, but for Dudley and Charlton, one grade eight lesson for everybody. Um, and we are a little bit different than Northboro Southboro because we're full regional, um, where Northboro is K to eight, Southboro is K to eight, and then Algonquin comes together. But I think um, that's our that's been definitely a challenge that has been presented itself in the past, and we've really um, worked hard together. And our teachers really collaborated, especially over technology, which is something that they're not used to doing either. Um, and, and they really shown true over the last several months. So that's been great to see. Thank you. And I think it really was a, a challenge 
thinking that you didn't have any warning that this was happening or pre-planning. It just yeah, was on think- laps, came on your desk and you had to, um, you know, turn the uh, tables around and see what you could, what you could do. And thank you for your response. I appreciate it. You're welcome. This is uh, Sean O'Shea. I just have one question. Um, do you see any challenges? I believe one of the school committee members in Dudley Charlton is an administrator yep. at Algonquin. I know Kathleen. Yeah. <laughs> and it would re- reverse the roles. Do you see any challenges in that uh, situation? No, I don't. Um, <clears throat> actually, Kathy, I, don't, I think I saw her name online um, and she's in the meeting. Her and I have had actually some collaborative discussions. I think it would be, um, she knows my children. Um, it, I think it would be fine. I'm not, I'm really not out for any, anything adversarial. I just want to serve my community. Thank you. Yep. So can I just ask you a quick question? This is Kathy. Um, our meetings are the third Wednesday of every month. Will that be something that um, works for your schedule? Yep. Okay. And sometimes there's more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like we have. Are. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Karen, this is Kathleen Holland. Uh, welcome to the meeting, and and it's wonderful that you want to serve the community. And in reading your uh, vita, I noticed that there were a lot of references to STEM, and you noted that you had been a part of the um, STEM program here in town with the Junior Women's League, which is so impressive. And there were some references to the arts, but I wasn't clear on your advocacy for the arts from your curriculum, and I would appreciate you illuminating that, please. Sure. Well, the district position that I was um, in was the STEAM director, and so that was science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, Quite honestly, um, that was a brand new position five years ago, um, and quite honestly, that's, to be quite honest and fair, that's why I'm leaving. The position was cut um, from the budget, um, and I have another position that I'm moving forward to um, in August. Um, But with the arts, we have a very, I, I didn't quite honestly, we tried to blend that. It was just, we had, when I got there, we didn't even have Google accounts for the kids. So we really had to focus on the T first of STEM. And quite honestly, allow, doing that allowed us to successfully pull off our remote learning um, when the rug got pulled out, out from us in, in March um, and working over that the last five years. So basically I worked on a lot of tech, I worked on the science, the new STE standards. Um, not to say that I didn't include the arts, but w- w- some things that we, di- that we did do was, for example, um, uh, some of the Ozo, Ozobots in the elementary arts curriculum and creating different things with um, robots, um, after school clubs um, and so forth. So, was work in progress. Thank you. Yep. Does anybody else have any questions? Kathy, I have one last one. Okay. Um, uh, Kathy Highland, uh, oh no, Kathy Key, you brought it up, is the meetings that we have every, you know, the third Wednesday. But we also do a lot of uh, background work in our subcommittees. We have... Right. Uh, you know, the operational capital, we have a start time, we have a solar subcommittee uh, policy. Do you see yourself uh, on any of those bringing your strengths from your background? Oh, I, well, I just heard you mention the solar subcommittee. I'm actually with environmental, former environmental science teacher. So that would very much interest me. And I was reading the minutes. I didn't realize I'm not familiar with where you have the solar. Is that something that you're looking into? Where? Yeah, so we're... Yeah, that would be excellent. I would love that. Okay, thank you, Karen. Mm-hmm. Great, well, thank you, Cam- thank you, Karen. We're gonna, um, I think, put you back into the okay. attendees and then um, we have two other people to interview for tonight. So we'll get back to you. Thank you. All right, Karen, so I'm gonna make you an attendee again and then um, you can listen in on the next set of interviews, so thank you.
Greg, just let me know when we're set. Um, yes, give me one second. All right, so now I'm going to promote um, Rob Berger, the next candidate. And Karen doesn't seem, Karen doesn't want to go back to the attendee list, so you can you can stay right where you are. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Should I move myself? I'll mute my. Is Rob on? I believe Rob has joined us. Rob, are you there? I just need him to unmute. Me. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Hey Rob, this is Kathy Key. I'm the chair of the um of the school committee. How are you? Hi, Kathy. Thank you for having me this evening. Yep. So we want to um thank you for applying for the position uh, for the town of Northboro. Um, Thanks. and we just want to ask you to share some of your background and why you're interested to serve on the um as a Northboro resident. Okay. Well, I've been a resident of Northboro for over 30 years. Uh, a little gray, but still uh still a happy member of society here in Northboro. Uh, I've been involved in many programs in town, uh, group program, Northboro, Southboro softball, uh, on the board of that program for over eight years, great relationship between Northboro and Southboro and the athletics. Um, I also had the honor of teaching geology to the fourth grade at Z school for probably six years until there was a slight change in the curriculum and my services were no longer needed. But I did enjoy spending uh, a couple of hours with the fourth fourth grade classes at Z. Um, other items on uh, Northboro, I spent three years on the zoning board and was happy to uh, provide my services on zoning. Uh, I'm a licensed site professional in Massachusetts, licensed by the Commonwealth. So I have a strong background in regulatory affairs with environmental, also uh, interpreting regulations and putting them into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, being in the environmental field, I'm very key on upgrades and new technology as they evolve, keeping up to date and uh, putting those into use. Uh, I was, I'm also currently the uh, chairperson of the Hall of Fame committee for Algonquin for the athletic program. We're on our uh, second round. We just completed our second round of inductees last Thanksgiving. We will have our next round uh, in two years when the Thanksgiving game returns to our home field advantage. Um, I was boosters, athletic boosters for five years during the time that my two student athlete daughters were attending Algonquin and uh, president of boosters for two years, but involved for five. I'm still involved with boosters with the fundraising of the golf tournament, which is a great event. Everybody should come out and join us, which will happen hopefully sometime, uh, maybe in August, if all goes well, if not, it'll end up being postponed. But right now I think we're on schedule for hopefully having an August event. Um, I also get to speak when I was with Boosters at Senior Night, which is probably the highlight of my involvement with Algonquin, getting up and honoring our seniors uh, for Booster Scholarships. That was uh, one of the honors that I got to do for many years, and I actually miss it. It's a great time to inter interact with the uh, students at Algonquin. And that's kind of my background. I'm also a uh, volunteer reserve deputy with our Worcester County Sheriff's Department. Throw that in. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? From any of our... 
uh, this is Lauren Bailey Jones. Um, I saw that um, you had three years on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, yeah. So can you maybe speak to a challenge that um, that you went through uh, during your three years there and maybe how it would help you make decisions on the school committee? Well, one event always sticks in my mind on zoning and it's when the town of Northboro was reviewing permits for the Pierce Oil property on West Main Street. Uh, it, it, the project didn't go through. It was going to be residential, uh, dense residential, along with retail on the first floor, two buildings on what I thought was a very compact piece of property. And uh, I was the only member that voted in the negative for that project to go forward. Uh, wasn't worried about being the only one. Uh, had my opinion and stuck with it. And it turns out that the project never went through due to the property owner or the potential buyer getting cold feet and not thinking the project would work. And uh, now we're hoping that the new fire station goes there. But it was uh, the reason I bring that one up is to show that I'm, you know, if, if I feel on one side of an issue, I'm okay to stand up on my own and back it up. Thank you so much for sharing, Rob. Absolutely. Anyone else? Kathy, I have a question. Okay. Um, hi, Robert. This is Joan Frank, Northboro member of the region. Um, yes. Thank you for putting your name in as a candidate for this position. And thank you. Uh, thank you also for the time and efforts that you have done in volunteering in both the town and especially for our high school. Um, I know that, you know, when you're on the boosters and when you're also as the chairperson, you're dealing again with a lot of personalities and a lot of people, um, right. a lot of representatives from each of the, of the sports that, you know, work together with you along with the athletic director. Mm -hmm. What would you say was a really good moment when you came away from, you know, as chairperson of the boosters, when you went, wow, that was really great. And if you could tell us in detail or you just, you yep. just had a sense of accomplishment. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that really sticks out in my mind as one of my successes for boosters, when I first introduced the Fidrich Foundation to unify track and we presented Mr. Mead, uh, principal at that time, and um, the program with a check for $10,000 for the Unified Sports Program. Uh, it was just up and coming, had been up and growing for a few years. It's thriving now, which is absolutely wonderful. But to work through the process of getting the Fidrich Foundation to approve the first grant to the uh, Unified Track Program was uh, an absolute highlight. I, I absolutely adore the Unified Track and Unified Sports athletes. They need representation. And um, the Fidrich Foundation now, along with Unified Sports, every year makes a donation. So I felt I kicked off that relationship. I stepped aside and it's just thriving in the Unified Sports Program. is thriving because of what we helped with and what boosters did to introduce the two parties together. Thank you for that achievement and for the continuing uh, growth that the uh, your successors have had and the follow up with it that it wasn't just a one time initiative. So no, thank and, you. And, and I must say that after I retired from that role in boosters, the uh, other presidents that took over grabbed that program and brought it much higher than I did. And I got to tip my hat to them. They really really did a heck of a job for the last few years. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Sean. I just have one question. And Greg, is this for three years or how many years is this term? So this, uh, this is Lynn Winters seat and she has one a year left on her. One term. year left, okay. Um, so my question is what, what's the passion that's um, drawing you to uh, come spend Wednesday, Wednesday nights uh, <laughs> uh, talking about all of these things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to be honest, it's a family tradition. Um, 
my dad was always heavily involved in student athletics in the town of Randolph where I grew up. Um, I had a brother pass away. We put a scholarship into play in his name in the town of Randolph. It's just a family tradition of giving back to the community that we live in, making sure that as we pass through town, we leave our fingerprints in a good way uh, on the community and for the uh, members of our community, especially our uh, young folks. They deserve the support of the community. And I want to jump in as best I can and be an advocate for the kids. Thank you. Thank you. I follow up on that. Um, this is Paul Desmond. I'm a member from Southboro. So there's, there's a lot of ways to, to give back and, and you've proven that having done it in, in various capacities. But what specifically is attracting you to this school committee? You know, being involved in Hall of Fame, being involved in boosters, I got to know a lot of the coaches who are teachers at the school, uh, administrators at the school. I worked with uh, uh, Fran Witten times two during his tenures. I worked with Kara Ellis. Uh, I work currently with Mike Mosserino. have a wonderful relationship with them, uh, the coaches, and many of them are teachers. And I want to uh, support them and uh, continue to grow and meet more of the staff and the administration and be a positive role model. I hope I answered your question, Paul. You did, thank you. Great. I'm so glad the other question that I asked Karen, so our meet, uh, this is Kathy Key, by the way. <clears throat> um, our meetings are the third Wednesday of every month. And I just wanna make sure that that's, mm -hmm. that works for you. Plus sometimes we have um, additional meetings and then um, subcommittees that we ask people to join. Sure. Yeah, I have no problem with that as long as I can put it in my calendar. I'm, I'm good to go. I work local and uh, I would be available. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Kathy, I have a follow up to your question. Yep. About the subcommittees. Um, Robert, I know that uh, we have many different subcommittees. I'm sure one that you would probably go on to right away. Uh, if appointed tonight would be the liaison to the boosters, uh, which would be a great fit. But oh, we also okay. have like capital pro uh, subcommittees on cap capital uh, operational um, liaisons to different, mm -hmm. like the APTO. We have also policy, mm -hmm. which is the main function. One of the main functions of the school committee is to, you know, to write and to review policies. And I was just wondering if there would, what, which subcommittees would really interest you besides the boosters? Uh, besides boosters, I have a strong background running my own corporation for the over the last 20 years, um, budgeting, finance, appropriation. I have a strong handle on that as a uh, entrepreneur myself. Um, I deal heavily on a daily basis with regulation and policy. If there's a fit there, I'd be happy to provide my services in that arena. But, uh, you know, as a Newbie to the program, I think I, if I get selected, I'm happy to fit in where I need. Thank you very much for your time and, and consideration. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thank you. Okay, Rob, we um, thank you so much. And we're just going to, um, we have one more person to interview for tonight. Sure. Hey, Rob, it's Greg Martin. I'm going to promote you uh, to an attendee. So okay. hang on. Thank one you, second. Greg. Okay, and I'm going to promote our last candidate as a panelist, and I think we are all set. Hey, Carrie, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you guys see me? Hopefully. Uh, yes. <laughs> you can hear me yet, I hope. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. I'm Kathy Key. I'm the chair for the North Borough South Borough Regional School Committee. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Um, so welcome to our meeting. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you for applying as a Northborough resident for the um, vacancy um, for Northborough. Um, can you start by just sharing your background and why you um, want to serve um, on the Northborough Southborough Regional School Committee? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me here, especially in these odd Zoom filled days. I'm sure we're all feeling that. Um, I actually grew up in Needham, Massachusetts. My husband did as well. And when we were looking for a place to buy our own home, Northborough was at the top of our list because we really enjoyed the almost semi-rural feel, but still with a, a community of growth. And one of the things was the strength of the schools. We actually bought our house the same weekend that Wegmans opened, which was very interesting. I still remember the backup down the street. And at the time we had never heard of Wegmans, but we live about a mile from it. Um, I am a public school teacher. I have been a public school teacher for eight years now. Two of my first years were in Framingham, and now I've been working for six years in the Hopkinton Public Schools. Um, at, in Hopkinton, I've worked in both math and science. I actually was on a mini looping team there where I taught two classes of math and two of science and looped with those same children all the way through. It's given me a really, really good background in the math and science curriculum in Massachusetts. Hopkinton kept me very busy and they are still keeping me busy. I've been bounced around various places trying to fill gaps and it's, it's given me good insight into what's available. In addition, working in two vastly different school districts made me very interested in the policy and the business slash budgetary side of being a teacher. Now that I'm in a more settled role in Hopkinton, I've been seeking out ways to be a leader in that community. I am currently the co-CTL, which is curriculum teacher leader or department head of the science department there. I always seek out you know, interview committees and things like that. I've also seeked out opportunities outside of the Hopkinton School community to kind of learn more about the decision-making policies in public education. Mm -hmm. I've twice served on MCAS committees where we determine cut scores for the MCAS tests, uh, one for math and one for science. All of this has made me very interested in you know, educational policy. Um, I'm currently, well, I should say just today, I finished living the remote teaching Zoom lifestyle. It was Hopkinton's last day today. And when I saw this opening, I felt I had to apply because I would really like to get more involved in the, in, in the business side of things for education. On a personal side, I'm the mother of a young son. My son is four right now. And now that he is old enough to, as he puts it, wipe his own butt and put on his own clothes, I have a little bit more free <laughs> time. Um, he also announced that to several of my classes via Zoom while I was teaching this year. So that was very interesting. But he will be entering the you know, Northborough Public Schools in a year. We have one more year of daycare to pay for. And that has added a personal flavor to this. So I hope that answered your question. That's great. <laughs> it's such a typical boy thing to say. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, uh, Kathy, through the yep. chair. Yes. Hi, hi, Carrie. This is Joan Frank, a uh, Northborough member of the Regional School Committee. Uh, hi. Thank you for, hi. Thank you for giving your time and effort to go into this position. Um, you, had, you said, you know, you were bouncing around uh, so many times and doing science and there's so many challenges, but mm -hmm. can you um, take one of those times and in, in more detail, give us about a challenge and maybe it was successful and maybe the outcome was, was very successful and unsuccessful or successful. So can you just highlight something that has happened in your career? So... When I started being a, a public school teacher, I actually started as a maternity leave sub in Hopkinton. Then I went to Framingham. And what drew me back to Hopkinton was they had a posting for a math slash science position. And it was for this mini team. They basically had what they called a bumper crop of kids that year. They had an extra bubble of about 50 students. So it wasn't enough for a full team. They needed someone to teach the math science side and someone to teach the humanities side. When I accepted that, they really said, you can make this your own. That was scary to me as a relatively new teacher. It was kind of terrifying to be given that much control over what the daily schedule looked like for these students. 
And I was lucky to get a great partner on the humanities side. And we made several schedule changes. For example, some days instead of teaching math and then science, I would just teach science for two hours straight. Now that meant I would have to make up the math the other day, but it allowed me to do much more hands-on in-depth labs as for sixth graders at the time, sixth graders. And we were doing labs that I had modified down from the high school level. For example, we extracted DNA from a strawberry. And that, uh, you know, that wiggle room that I was given really allowed me to see that I was up to a challenge like that and really allowed the school system to see that there is room for change within their schedule. I hope that answered your question. No, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mary, uh, this is Lauren Bailey Jones. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what experience you have working with budgets um, in your leadership in your school district. Great question. Um, so as co-CTL, which again is what we call the department head, we have to manage the budget for the budget for our department. And as the science department uses a lot of consumables, we actually have the largest budget at the middle school and it's multiple times larger than other departments. That was terrifying to me at first, but I think that we have managed well, myself and my co-leader. And it's also given me some insight into what needs to be cut, what needs to be changed and what can be maintained. In addition, before I became a public school teacher, I worked at the Princeton Review, the test preparation company for multiple years. Um, my highest point there was I was operations manager and I managed the teachers plus the payroll at that location. Um, in that role, uh, my region went from Maine down to part of Connecticut. So it was basically all of New England. And it meant that I had to look at how much we were spending, how much we were bringing in and where adjustments could be made. Thank you. So this is Kathy. Um, so I know you're busy um, teaching and, um, and being a mom. Our meetings are the third Wednesday of every month. Um, sometimes we do have more. Um, every third, every three months, we have a combined meeting, which goes a little bit longer, and then subcommittees. Do you find that? Do you think that would be a an issue at all? Time no, I think that would absolutely work. I'm lucky enough that my son likes to go to sleep fairly early, which leaves my evenings now free. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Kathy. Yep. I'll do the uh, same follow up that I had done for the other two candidates. Um, besides the, as Kathy, as our chairperson, Kathy Key has mentioned our burglary scheduled meetings. Um, we also have sometimes the other ones that come up with a combined meeting that, you know, if the agenda is busy, we have to uh, schedule an extra one. So I'm sure you'd be able to attend them. But we also have, as you know, from working in the school system, we have background work that get, gets done through our subcommittees. Mm -hmm. and some of them are the operational, which is the daily budget capital, which are projects that would be more than like $5,000, you know, improvements to pavement and mm -hmm. um, buildings. Mm -hmm. And also policies, which is the driving force of, the, of our school committee. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have liaisons to different committees. We have solar, we have school start time, uh, mm -hmm into we have that initiative you know and a lot of through the superintendent a lot of uh, uh, polling that goes out to the parents and ask them you know to see what their viewpoints are what do you think would be your strengths that you would like to offer your expertise on a subcommittee I would say I have two strengths in there um, as an operations manager previously before being a teacher I had a large group of teachers that I had to communicate regularly with so any kind of you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's operational aspect, I have background in. Also, I have been a STEM teacher at Framingham and math and science. So anything related to those subject matters would be right down what I love to do. Okay, thank you. And welcome to Northboro. You chose, you and your husband chose one of the two finest districts <laughs> to move into between Northboro and Southboro. And your <laughs> son will have a fabulous time at Proctor. So you'll become, thank a, you. your thank father you. will become a Proctor, Proctor Papa. You know, as a yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. We love it here. We we every day we enjoy our decision to move here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Carrie. Um, we're just gonna have a few minutes to um, talk about stuff, and then we'll get right back to you.
So stay, stay where you are. I will. <laughs> Carrie, I'll, I'm going to move you to the attendee. Um, okay. And then, um, so thank you very much. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And they will be able to meet in person. Right, I would love to. <laughs> All right, Kathy, I think we're all set. Okay, so, um, all right, so I guess it's like the Northboro committees to, um, to talk about the three different people. Greg, Karen is still present. Yeah, I'm still here. You might want to move me out. Yeah, Karen's still here. The, the attendee list is not cooperating this evening, so. <laughs> Right, I believe we're all set. Okay, so is there um, discussion? What are you? What are your thoughts, Kathy? I know that. Um, could we hear from all the member? If any member wants to uh, give us uh, advice or give us their feelings on on different candidates, the strengths of you know the candidates. From Southboro, that would be helpful. Yeah, does anyone want to? Who wants to kick it off? I mean, I. Yeah. I'd be happy to. No, Sean, go ahead. I, I mean, I can start. I think I think we're lucky to have three really good candidates. Two stand out to me, Karen and Rob, and for different reasons. Um, and uh, um, I'm weighing in my head some of our challenges in the year year ahead. That we're going to be facing and which one might be able to add uh, and balance um, perspective of the committee those are the i think rob's you know got a lot of I, I like the fact that he made a tough decision and stuck with it on the planning zone zone of appeals and brought that forward he also has some business aspect and then karen has you know the high level educational aspect and and um curriculum focus and, and those two. So um, those are my top two. And I'd be, I'd be happy to, Kathy, give some perspective. I mean, I thought um, Karen's interview was what I thought was the best that she, she would bring the most to the position, especially, you know, with, with her experience. And um, I thought, you know, clearly Rob had a, a lot of varied experience and knowledge of the, of the community. Uh, Carrie being uh, newer to the town, you know, would bring that perspective as well, um, and clearly has some operational background. Um, out of the three, I personally thought Karen's um, was the strongest. I'm in agreement with that Karen's was the strongest. I think that what it took to get the town common together, um, and I thought in relatively short order for, in contrast to many of the projects in the community. I think good that point. Yeah, good point. I forgot about that part. I, I would say that this is a hard decision. I think that we have three outstanding candidates. And as we go forward, I just hope that the other two candidates will keep their hat in the ring uh, in involvement in schools. There's so many different avenues that they can and uh, stay involved. And this is an only one year position. So next year, um, this position will be up for um, on the ballot for a three year position. So um, I was torn between probably all three, but Karen and Carrie, I like their background, but I, to me, the strongest one is Karen. Lauren, what do you think? I think, I think that I would probably agree um, with Karen's background with, um, with um, experience as an administrator was pretty impressive. Um, um, I thought that I, I, like Sean said, I really liked um, Rob's comment about making challenging decisions and not necessarily going with what everyone else is feeling, but sticking up for really what their decision is in their heart. 
Um, and I also do think that Carrie brings that sort of newer perspective, having um, a younger child and bringing that new perspective. Um, overall, I think I would probably go with Karen um, because of her administration background. So I would like, based on all the uh, comments that were made, and I appreciate the um, insight and the input from the Southboro members, it's very important because we're all, we're all one team when we all work together. Um, I would like to put in the name of, uh, support the name of K appoint Karen Ayers to the one-year position as the Northboro member of the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee for the year 2020 to 2021, one-year position. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Joan made the motion and I just, I just like to listen to see what people have to say, but I agree with all of you. I think that Karen is a great um, interviewer, but I hope that the other two still stay around so they can give us their insight too, because I thought it was great. I thought it was three great interviews. Um, so Joan made the motion and Sean seconded it. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's just for Northboro. So, um, so Joan. Yes. Kathleen Halland. Yes. Um, Sean? Yes. And Lauren? Yes. Okay. Um, so Greg, what do we do next? So I'm going to uh, promote uh, Karen back to a panelist. And then we have uh, Andy Dowd, who is the Northboro Town Clerk, who will swear her into her new role. And I just want to make a, a comment as well that it's nice when you have three candidates where you could pick any one of them and they would do an amazing job. So it's a good problem to have. And do we, do we do anything else with um, Rob and Carrie or? They're more than welcome to um, stay as attendees and listen uh, to the meeting. Okay. So thank you, you know, Carrie could... and Rob for, um, for applying. You had great interviews and we hope that you stick around. Um, and like we said, it's a one-year position. So next year is another um, time to vote. And I'd like to welcome Andy Dowd. So welcome, Andy. Thank you, Greg. And Karen, you're with us? Yes. Yeah. I have the honor of giving you your oath via Zoom. So if you would just raise your right hand. I'll make you official. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee in accordance with the bylaws of the town and the laws of the Commonwealth? So help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you, Andy. You're very welcome. Welcome, Karen. Welcome, congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, welcome so aboard. <laughs> So now you're official member. Um, so we have more to go in our meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you're, so you can stick around for the rest of our meeting. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, great. Well, hopefully we can, hopefully at some point soon we can meet you in person. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see, what is our next? Um, COVID-19 health situation. So uh, I have the pleasure of um, <laughs> sharing with a committee that yesterday um, was the last day of uh, school for our students. And I just wanna commend all the teachers at Algonquin and faculty and staff and the leadership team for the great work they did during um, the COVID health situation. Um, as you know, we've been out of school since March um, 13th. And um, I can honestly say that the work that Algonquin has done to support students is, is very impressive. So I just wanna thank faculty and staff. Um, although yesterday was the last day of school for our students, we're really now looking forward to the fall and really thinking about what fall reopening will look like. We have three scenarios that we're planning for. One is a full reopening. Uh, the second is a hybrid approach. And we are waiting for some guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education around what that guidance will be. Most likely it will be fairly prescriptive with the department um, basically sharing with all 351 districts um, what that will look like. 
we're hoping to receive guidance by the end of this week um, and greater detail um, supposedly will be released on the second week in July. So we're, we're in a bit of a holding pattern. We do have a reopening advisory panel that has done a lot of great work up to this point. Uh, but again, we're just waiting for more information. So at this point, I um, would be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if there are no questions, I turn it over to Keith Lavoy, who can speak to some of the operations work and planning that is taking place. Anybody have any questions? Keith. Excellent. So yes, I do have a couple items I'd like to update the committee on this evening. Uh, like Greg said, we did uh, post things out uh, yesterday for Ennisboro Connect 2.0. Uh, the buildings have been busier with uh, students or families coming back to the buildings to collect belongings and, and teachers doing everything they can to prepare their classrooms for uh, summer cleaning. We are almost there. We just have a few more teachers that need to wrap things up. And I believe the administrative staff has almost concluded all the student belonging uh, pickups as well. So we are wrapping that up. And, and Mike Gorman is now uh, getting into full swing with all the summer preparations that need to take place. Uh, at the top of the list is certainly paying close attention to the guidance we get from the state and making sure that Algonquin is ready for whatever school will be in the fall. Right now, we are looking uh, closely at plexiglass, believe it or not, and how that can be implemented in the reception areas of the school. And there are many at Algonquin. So we're looking at a lot of different creative solutions. And Mike is working with uh, different vendors to provide those solutions for us. And we're kind of in a holding pattern until we get that guidance. But that's certainly something that he's working on with a lot of detail. The other thing that he's been exploring is certainly the sizes of classrooms and how we can space students safely in different rooms at what different orientations. So that has been definitely part of, of his work in the building prep part of things for the summer. The other thing I wanted to update you on is the uh, town meeting situation. I know Mr. Dowd is, uh, was on the meeting earlier, but I uh, want to mention that Southboro did have a successful town meeting on um, Saturday. A lot went into the planning of that. Mr. Hegarty, the town clerk of Southboro, was very creative, did a lot of different things to make it happen for the community. And overall, I heard a lot of people mention that uh, they like being outside. It was gorgeous weather. It was 70 degrees. I guess it did get a little crispy there towards the end, uh, but they were able to conduct a successful town meeting. Corresponding to that, Northboro is planning to do something similar. I did receive official word uh, that the uh, town meeting is scheduled for uh, July 11th at 9 a.m. and it will be held on the stadium football field. We are making a few adjustments to the space to make sure that it is safe for all attendees and that's something that uh, we will continue to work on. Uh, Mike Gorman has been uh, intimately involved in that working uh, very closely with uh, Scott Charpentier uh, to assist with all the preparation of the space. So those are the two major things. The other um, thing that kind of wrapped up that it's amazing that it did occur, but we wrapped up our food services delivery program. Uh, Monday was the last day of delivery. I do want to thank Diane Kofer for all her work uh, through the Algonquin Kitchen and her staff. They did an amazing job of preparing the meals for delivery. And Mary Ellen Duggan and the team of nurses uh, executed flawlessly right to the end. And we were able to support many families in town. But that, that program has concluded as of Monday. So those are the three major pockets uh, that are happening right now and certainly uh, COVID related. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee has. So I have, I have one. So they're not meeting until the middle of July. So does that mean that the town of Northboro and including I guess the Northboro K to eights are operating with a July budget that's one twelfth of the prior year's budget? That is accurate. So the, the finance team has put together 112 budgets for the region and the North Row. We also, um, just as a precaution, put a 112 budget forward for South Row. So the next major milestone for the regional budget um, is uh, July 11th, as Keith indicated. So is there any issue for the region that, that you know, in terms of how no, that's um, You know, we've looked at it closely and, and Becky's done a lot of analysis because most of, um, you know, the payroll and, and so forth. Right. So we are 
we are um, in good shape and we're hoping that the uh, July 11th date, um, town meeting date is successful. Thank you. Kathy, that is a nice... Go ahead, John. Okay, Kathy, I have a question through you to Keith. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, hey, Keith, I watched the um, remotely the North Grove Selectman's meeting on Monday and several questions came up from people that had called in. One was saying about, and this might be too early, one was that, you know, asking about restrooms and would they able to use the high school facilities? And the remark was made that the high school facilities will be off limits. And so they were asking, and I know it might be too soon if there's going to be, um, you know, porta potties that are going to be set up and how are they going to take care of it if it's the, you know, if it's the heat? So I'm just asking that question because people that, you know, watch the selectmen's meeting also watch our meeting. So Joan, I'll, I can answer that actually. So we've been working very closely with um, John Kader and his team. Um, and originally, as you, you might know, have known, the town meeting was supposed to be inside the gymnasium and obviously the success of the South Road town meeting, um, but we're allowing the use of our facilities and they will be using the outdoor facilities um, on the athletic field as part of um, the town meeting. Okay, thank you. All right. So if there are uh, no other questions for Keith, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Rebecca Pellegrino. I just wanna uh, compliment Becky and her team. They've been living uh, budgets since early October. Um, and I think they can see the end or uh, close to the end and they've done an outstanding job. And Becky will give an update on uh, the finance department and the work that it is doing. Thank you, Greg. Um, so as we were just discussing, uh, we will be uh, operating under a 112 budget. Um, there have been many calls um, held by DESE um, with the statewide business managers group because we are not the only regional school district who is in this situation. Uh, and they actually had us submit documentation to DESE on June 1st in anticipation of towns not being able to hold town meetings. Um, they did instruct districts who had town meetings scheduled in June to submit this documentation as a precaution. Um, and I did inform them that we are now anticipating um, operating under the 112 budget. Um, so we will wait back to hear back from the commissioner as um, he will be the one that will ultimately set what that 112 budget will look like. Um, but uh, Chris Tague, our treasurer, and Caroline Willard and has, has put together a spreadsheet so that we could anticipate what our costs will be in July. Um, and as Greg said, we do feel confident that we will be able to um, absorb the costs that, are, um, that we will be receiving in July without any issue. Um, also, uh, on another note on COVID-19, um, so as a result of the closure, we did see some uh, reductions in our heating and our electricity as we had anticipated. Um, so those were uh, two positive results. Um, right now, our heating is tracking at a savings of about 25,000 and our electricity is tracking at a savings of 28,000. Um, Additionally, I've been working with Mary Ellen and Keith, and I'm sure Mary Ellen will fill you in more um, to order PPEs for um, our year round staff and also in preparation for the next school year. Um, we are actually participating in a, a statewide purchasing effort and submitting some documentation um, to the state so that they will have anticipated numbers from school districts on all of the um, high need items that will be required to open schools. Um, I just wanted to also send out a big thank you to Nancy Bissett who helped to coordinate these orders with us. Um, we are also working with district and building level administrators to plan purchases for supplies and materials that may be needed on the first day of school, whatever that first day of school looks like. Um, and then finally, Caroline Willard has been working closely with Keith Lavoie and Diane Cooper um, 
to process food service balances for any 12th graders and also to collect any outstanding balances for our food services. Um, so that is what has been happening in our world as a result of the closure. Anybody have any questions for um, Martha? Thank you. All right, so we have uh, Mary Ellen Duggan, our wellness coordinator, who will share a little bit about um, the work that her and her team have been working on. Hi, everybody. Um, the nurses were busy all through the closure, delivering lunches, checking on their high-risk kids, and um, we're getting ready to hire two new nurses at the high school, both of them retired. So um, we're in the process of that. We have some very strong candidates, which is nice. Um, the PPE, which Becky mentioned, we're in the process of ordering it to get ready for next year um, and maybe even the summer program, what we might need for that, if that comes to fruition in person. So that's really what we're doing now is planning and waiting for the guidelines so that we can have safety measures in place. We've, we have outlines of safety that we've gone through with the committee, but um, until we get the guidelines, they really won't be written in stone anywhere until we get those from DESE. Any questions? Kathy, I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Um, so Mary Ellen, um, students who were receiving meals during the closure, um, what kinds of resources do they have during the summer? So um, for the summer, there are summer lunch programs through the federal lunch program. And the closest one to us is at Richer School in Marlboro. And the ones in Worcester. And anybody can go to those for lunches. Um, you can just kind of like our lunch. Anybody can get anybody can go to lunches there. The um, Northbrook Community Meals are, will be starting up soon. And Nutrition 68 is going to continue through the summer. Thank you, Mary Ellen. You're welcome. This is Sean. I just, uh, Keith had talked about the facilities planning, but in the nurse's office, are they, do you anticipate any, um, there's supposed to be like an isolation room and things like that. Are you anticipating any physical overhauls of the nursing area? So, um, we are anticipating the nurses have been planning to because we need to have a healthy section really yeah. and a sick mm -hmm. section um so right. that's what the nurses have been talking <laughs> to principals about i know some um the high school nurses really had it almost like a triage mm -hmm. area a sick area a healthy area um so they had it planned mm -hmm. out as to what they would think was best um as for isolation um that's the biggest discussion. Do we need a separate room or would a curtain around suffice? Um, there's different, you know, mm -hmm. opinions on that because it is droplet. It's not in the air, so it can't, you know, get on an air current and go anywhere. It's just going to, if you cough or any kind of droplet, it's just going to fall to the surface. So um, we're waiting to get guidance on that too. Okay. Um, I was just trying to get a sense of whether you know, construction or something is going to need to be done. We're going to add a wing out into the new, the parking lot out front of the condo. <laughs> we're going to yeah, cool. get some isolation tents and put them outside. <laughs> no, in all honesty, though, thinking of creative solutions is part of the work yeah. that we are uh, planning for now. So if there is something that can be done to uh, make things <laughs> and give our nurses more options at these critical moments. We're gonna we're gonna put those in place. So it's been an ongoing conversation. None of this is none of this is simple. Um, nope. But the last thing we want to do is be taking down walls or putting walls up. So if yeah. we can be creative in other ways, then that's going to be uh, the primary avenue to take. So one you. one nurse's office did move to a different place across the hall because they didn't have great ventilation. In another um, building, right? What? Algonquin or another building? At another building. At another building, right. So, yeah. So they're all in the plans, anything that might be needed to be done. So, Marianne, this is Kathy, and I know this is going to kind of be a, like a crazy question for you, but um, it kind of has to do with more the fall. 
do you guys have any plans to um, think about uh, mosquitoes <laughs> and the high school before, you know, before September? Just have a, like a plan in place. So I was on my first Tripoli webinar last week, Department of Health. <laughs> I, I, know it, I know it sounds crazy, but I have it to ask. It sounds crazy. We're going to have a double header in the fall and a triple header once flu season comes. So um, they did talk a lot about spraying, about they, they watch the, you know, checking the mosquitoes, testing the mosquitoes. They're always doing that. The peak is in the summer. Really, you know, like July, August is when it's showing the peak in the mosquitoes. So um, we will be planning on that. Yes. Okay. That will be in our plans, our health and wellness plans. I know it doesn't. I know you don't want a part of the conversation, but <laughs> in part of the planning, though. It has yeah. to be part of, exactly. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And next is Heather Richards um, and the HR department. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so the Human Resources Department and the team has really been supporting a lot of employees on an individual basis. And oftentimes I say that it's invisible because it is on a one-on-one -on -one basis that we're providing support. Um, and we've seen an uptick in the number of people asking about benefits when their spouses may have lost their, their jobs. Um, and so we've been answering a lot of questions around that. Um, and supporting employees with that. And then um, people have had a lot of questions about absences and accommodations. And we've been having conversations with employees about um, possible accommodations as needed. And those are on a case by case basis, depending on what the, in the person's condition may be. Uh, in addition to that, um, there have been a number of unemployment claims um, and some of those claims are fraudulent claims. I don't know if you've, you've heard, but um, the state has seen an uptick in fraudulent unemployment claims. So even our, some of our active employees who are still working, um, there have been claims put in um, on their behalf. Um, and so the HR department has really been supporting employees around that and providing coaching and guidance on what to do um, if they, if they are a victim of, of fraud. Um, so we've, we've been trying to provide supports around employee wellness and providing um, different courses or trainings as available. Um, but one of the big areas where we're focusing on right now um, is recruitment of um, substitutes. So we have active postings for substitutes for the fall and um, so if anybody's interested, they can certainly go out and apply uh, to be in our sub pool. And um, I certainly have some outreach and recruitment efforts happening to try to make sure that we increase our sub pool with nurses, custodians, and educators for the fall. So Kat, I have a question if I could. Yep. And Heather, I'm not sure if this is for you or for Becky, but there's been a couple of articles I read in the paper recently that talked about kind of mass notifications to non-tenured teachers because of some legal bait that needs to be given to them if they're not going to be renewed in the upcoming year. And these towns have kind of taken a, a, a I guess, a worst case position of not knowing if there'd be reductions in staff. And so, uh, just kind of globally gave notice to anyone who fell in the non-tenured position so that they would comply with some law, I guess. And so my question would be, if, if something horrible happens and the state doesn't give us a nickel, you know, for, for whatever reason, and we feel a need to reduce the workforce, will we be legally allowed to take that kind of action? Or since we missed that deadline, are we a little bit stymied? It, it, that's no issue at all. Um, so that's Mass General Law 71, I believe it's 41 or 42. Um, and that says if you are going to non-renew um, non-PTS educators, then you need to notify them by, by June 15th. 
Um, and budgetary um, reductions are very different than non-renewals. So if there are budgetary reductions that come down the pike, then we certainly still have um, flexibility to do to be responsive and do what so, we need. So why these towns? I mean, it, it really reads like they think it's because of budget squeezes that are going to come at them. That, and I think yesterday Franklin told 105 people that you know they were they were maybe on this bubble, um, and, and it certainly read in the at least in the article in the Boston Globe today that it had to do with money. I, I can share with you that some districts don't have HR professionals um, in their district, and they may not have um, HR directors who happen to be attorneys as well. Um, and so we we are, are in very solid legal ground um, if we do need to be responsive in the future. Well, thank you for that. Becky, aren't you glad this didn't go your way? <laughs> I waited for Heather. I, just, I, I waited for make, the attorney. <laughs> can I just make a, a general comment too? I think that it's very difficult to compare town to town because of fiscal management. And I think we're very fortunate, obviously, live um, to be part of a district where both communities are well managed. Um, and we're not seeing some of the financial challenges that other communities are seeing. So that has a factor to it as well. Um, we're, we're in a pretty good fiscal position um, and we're confident that the budget that we're bringing forth is one that um, takes into account all the variables that could happen moving forward with the state. Well, yeah, and I thought we had as well, Greg, and I, and I, I do agree with your point of view about the two towns. I mean, they're extraordinarily supportive from what I've heard and, and been involved in, you know, their, their, their tax receipts, although maybe they're not at 100% predicted levels, they're not horrible either. And, and they feel, uh, the, the people who are responsible for the finance feel like they're in reasonably good shape to, to go forward with the budget. So I just, that whole legal debate about, you know, having to make decisions about non tenured staff is just, uh, a bit of a surprise to me, and I've read about it over and over and over again the last couple of weeks or so, and I just, uh, uh, we never had to cross that bridge, to my knowledge. Appreciate the clarity. All right, thank you, Heather. And next we have uh, Marie Allen, uh, Director of Student Support Services. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are in student support services. We're very busy right now preparing for summer services, better known as extended school year. And although additional guidance is uh, coming from the Department of Ed, there was a June 8th memo from Russell Johnston, our State Director of Special Education. And in that memo, he specified that special education services will look different this summer we're still working on as the top priority, the health and safety of students, parents, guardians, and school personnel. Uh, it also said that schools will not be able to provide summer services in the same manner they typically do, just as we couldn't during our March through June building closure. However, all students will have access to those services described in their IEPs, and whether it's remote for most students or it's in person on a limited basis for high priority students, again, we are awaiting guidance on what that means. Uh, we have a Zoom meeting tomorrow with the Department of Ed and we're hoping to get additional information. We are currently preparing for both remote and in person. We're actively hiring staff and uh, we hope to have all the hires in place contracts have already started to go out. People are accepting those contracts. We expect to have people in place by the end of next week and early the following week. We will be doing training for all of the staff in summer to prepare for both the remote entry and then the possible in person for those high intensity or high need students. Uh, so that is really where our focus is right now in student support services. And um, we're waiting for guidance additionally like everybody else. 
Are there any questions? Well, just... Marie, I have a question, my usual Marie question. Okay. <laughs> um, Marie, I'm wondering if, um, if guidance comes out allowing some in-person um, ESY, um, will families get to choose whether they're in-person or remote or will that come from student support services? Um, we will we will give guidance on who we're targeting for the in-person because it has to be our high priority students as defined by the state, but parents can opt out of that and say they would prefer to continue with remote. So they will have the option of doing both, but all parents won't have the option of in-person uh, because we have to think about the safety of our, our students. So, and you know, the the capacity, the building capacity, and all of the things involved in that, the PPE, all of the things that everybody's talked about tonight. Thank you, Marie. This, this is Sean. Um, I guess I would just say two things. And uh, so it's my understanding too, one of the challenges with the summer is we won't be able to transport students to school. Um, that's not true. No. Uh, we okay. did, we, the, the good news is we did just get information from our ABC collaborative through Vanpool, and that's how we transport students in the yeah. summer, and they said they are ready and able to do that. The state is cautioning us against uh, doing all of that and trying to offer that and, and encourage parents to, if we do in person, to encourage parents to drop their kids off, uh, but if they can't, those transportation services would be available and we are counting on using that transportation. Wow. For well, that's fantastic. That's yeah, great. That's, that's great, great news. news. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say is like, I I know all the work, it's almost double planning. And I mean, you're only, you know, days away from starting to open. So I, I um, appreciate all your hard work and feel your pain. <laughs> so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Marie, this is Kathleen Howland. Um, I've been taking the meetings for NSPAC, as you know, and you have been fielding some very difficult questions. You have offered grace, information, patience. Um, I, I concur with Sean. It's a difficult position to be in, and, and you're working triple time by, the, by my view of just a little piece of your life. So I just really want to laud you for the heavy lifting that you've been doing with Grace. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate your support at those NSPAC meetings. I think we have a great team, and I think our parents are extremely collaborative, and I, and I appreciate all the work that everybody's doing and all the questions that they're putting forward so that we can work together and figure this out. I agree, those meetings are a good reason to leave the garden. Not on you. Thank you, Marie. All right, lastly, we have uh, Julie Doyle to give an update on uh, technology. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, as most of us did, uh, the end of the year was, was a combination of, of wrapping up this year at, and at the same time trying to plan for next year. But um, tech department, provided plenty of tech support and training for teachers. And I just have to um, say how proud I was to be part of the tech team. They went above and beyond the call of duty, um, helping families and teachers and loaning out devices. And it, it, um, they did a fantastic job. Um, we, uh, in May, uh, finally made a purchase of a Zoom license for the district. Um, we were using the free licenses that were provided by Zoom for educators, but we felt the need to maximize security. And so we did make the, the purchase of Zoom accounts for teachers and school administrators. And um, what's, what's nice is at the high school level and at the middle school that the new paid licenses integrate very well with Canvas. So that has been put into place um, because more than likely they'll be using this um, a lot next year as well. Uh, we are in the process still of making the transition to Power School, um, going live uh, probably the first week of July. But as I've mentioned at previous meetings, we have paid for an extension for our um, legacy system iPass, and we will have that right now for 90 days. And I think that that's probably all that we'll need. 
um, we then will have access to all the data and we will self self host the data and they're helping us with it, with that transition but the power school transition has been going very well we've been conducting trainings we've been doing um, data mi migration and Andy Mariotti the technology manager has been owning that and um, working very hard and according to the power school implementation team we are we are right on target um, we also feel very confident that this is the right platform to be with as we move forward into sort of uncertainty that uh, you know it might be that we have to totally adjust our schedule come July 15th and we feel as though the support of power school um, will help us through this much better than IPAS ever could. Um, we also are working towards what we can do to help students and families find success with the likelihood of the remote learning that will happen again next year. And based on survey feedback, uh, we've begun to look at more consistent ways to deliver assignments and um, you know, talk about Zoom meetings and, and provide other important information to students and families through Canvas. So uh, we have a group of teachers who are, who are looking at that and we will continue that work over the summer. And the last thing that I wanted to tell you is that we're firming up plans for our district to be one-to-one. -one. And for those of you who don't know what that means, probably most of you do, is that we will be providing a device for all of our students, um, K to eight. Uh, we felt as if um, the, the shared cart model that we've been using for years would not make sense in, in, in this current situation. So um, based on our inventory, and and the budget money that we do still have available to make purchases we feel confident that we'll be able to to make this work the high school will remain sort of a combination of of byod so students will be given the opportunity or the, the choice to either use their own device or we can issue them a chromebook as well so julie will um the kids from k to eight can they take their devices home with them then is that how it works yes okay Got to be like good. Yep. So Julie, a couple of things. One, one uh, kudos on the the one to one initiative. I think it's uh, I think it's a little bit overdue. I'm glad we're doing it. I think it's uh, I think it'll be a boon to to the district certainly. And and then just on the on the iPass replacement project, just uh, I don't know, just a, a caution from a guy who's been burned by software salesmen many more times than I can account. You know, every project is always on target until it's not, yeah. and and then it's then it's a surprise to them, and they're shocked beyond belief. But um, it, you know, it it won't be the first time it happened. Be a little pessimistic, and and uh, you know, kind of on the lookout as you as you deal with with those kind of folks, because their job is to tell you that everything's going to be perfect. And like I say, they will tell it to you right up until the day it's not. You know, Paul, Paul, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, we have run into a couple of, we didn't think they were as on target as we were, but what I feel as if um, is something that will benefit us. We have um, a former employee who worked in our technology department who uh, last year went through this transition in his new position. And so we have him sort of as an ally and sharing all the processes with us. So, um, but you're right. I, I feel as though we should still be guided, and uh, we're we're optimistic, but um, realistic as at the same time. No, and I'm glad you did the 90 day extension on the iPass. I think that's a it's it's a good cushion to have. And my guess is if you need to extend it a little bit more, iPass will gladly take your money. Absolutely, you're you're right about that. Thanks. Nicely done. Kathy, this is Sean. Good. Um. I'd like to ask about the one to one initiative. So it's it's K to eight. And then do the eighth graders roll up with their device or what is the the plan after eighth sure. grade? Yep, that's a good question, Sean. We we currently uh, probably will as kids transition from school to school, they'll actually get the device that belongs, you know, at their school. Mm -hmm. Um especially because we're at the high school where two towns and three school districts and the funding and all that. So we, we're still working out those details. We're um, um, right now we're using basically all the devices that we've purchased to be shared carts and we're handing mm -hmm. those out. So we have to really 
do um, a lot more research on the replacement cycle and what that will look like in future years. We, mm -hmm. we know we can make it work, but we're just not exactly sure of the details yet. And so, so I guess the, the, the details are still being worked out to whether or not to go one-to-one -one or leave some choice at the high school. Uh, I think currently, uh, yeah, you're right. I guess we're still working out those details, but I think that the BYOD um, combination um, of, and leaving choices is still something that we're um, probably mm -hmm. going to be continuing. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's, you know, fiscal reasons and things like that. I guess I would like to encourage more conversation, not tonight, but at another time to think about, um, and I'd like to see options and financial options and, and things like that. I think if you know we provide students textbooks and we don't expect them to pay for it, I, I would, this is a tool that they need to learn. It's not just an option anymore. I'd like us to consider, you know, buying those and providing those uh, for students. Um, you know, and maybe it's a rollout plan starting with the ninth grade or those eighth graders coming up and moving year to year. But um, I, I think it can leave in equities and some some quiet hardships that uh, families might not want to express um, if if it's not. Um, I know we have like 500 available, but you know we have 1,300 students, so. And, and that's quite a cost, but I, I think I'd like to explore that and, and and to learn more about if that's a possibility going forward. No, I think that I think you make a very valid point, especially now that we're actually moving one to one K to eight. So um, we we will continue to do that and and with with your help as well. So thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your updates. That was great. I just make a general comment that this team, um, which also includes Rhoda Webb, Stephanie Reinhorn, Jennifer Sucher, Erica Matthew, and Deb Lemieux, has been outstanding. Um, well, they're typically outstanding, but during this pandemic and the closure, they have uh, done tremendous work. Um, they've been extremely collaborative. The work that each department does intersects with other departments <laughs> and for the most part, they laugh at most of my jokes, not all of them, but most of them. And I think I think those are real smiles when we come together and meet and talk about really challenging topics. So I just wanna commend uh, this team for the work and their student-centered approach and um, still maintaining some sense of humor. It's been a crazy, it's a crazy, you know, few months and, uh, and I'm sure everyone's exhausted with it, but I hope you guys all know how much it's appreciated from all of us. So thank you. Um, all right, so our next is legislative update. So just a, a quick update, the area that we're focused on primarily is really monitoring the state budget and watching that progress or not progress. Um, really our areas that we're focusing on are chapter 70 um, state aid, a regional um, transportation reimbursement and circuit breaker. And we're also closely monitoring the Student Opportunity Act. So there are opportunities uh, to advocate on behalf of the district. And there are a few, there's actually a letter that I will submit uh, to Kathy to, to be able to submit to our local legislators to advocate to maintain funding for Chapter 70 regional transportation reimbursement and circuit breaker, uh, the funds that we rely on um, with our budget. Okay. Um, so next is a ratification of agreement with the Algonquin custodians. Sure. So we had uh, contract negotiations with Algonquin custodians. Um, we met on several occasions and we've come to um, uh, initial agreement. Um, and I'll have uh, Heather Richards speak to the uh, details of that agreement. Thank you. So, um, so it is a one year agreement that, um, that we have with the custodians. Um, and I, I believe that there's fair compensation. And, um, and in addition to that, there are some small language changes, um, such as getting sick time upfront um, on July 1st, instead of 
um, having that accrue on a monthly basis. And um, there are a few people who receive a travel reimbursement for travel throughout the district. And, uh, and that has had some slight increase, uh, like a $50 increase to the travel reimbursement. Um, and then if, um, if somebody is scheduled to work on, an, on a weekend event and there's less than 24 hours notice, then they would receive compensation, um, $100 in compensation for that last minute notice. Um, and then there is an increase in the clothing allowance. And that's um, in essence, the terms of, of what we had agreed to um, subject to the school committee vote and ratification. Madam Chair, I would vote, I would move that we vote to approve. Do we have to, um, Dan, I think you have to read that in. Can you see it? Uh, I can see it. I would, uh, my, I, I would motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement CBA between the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee and the Algonquin Regional High School Custodians from fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 2022. Second. Okay, so um, the motion by Dan Kalenda, second by Paul Bucca. Um, all right. So Kathleen Howland. Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. John Frank. Yes. Sean O'Shea. Yes. Lauren Bailey. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. And wait, do we have Karen vote on this too? She could, she could vote or she could abstain. Karen. I think for tonight. I think for tonight I'll abstain. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, that approves. Okay, so our next is a superintendent's report to the committee. This evening we have uh, Andy McGowan and Kathy Carmignani who will uh, give a brief uh, principal's report uh, focusing primarily on uh, graduation events. Good evening. Um, so yeah, June 7th, we had a outdoor um, awarding of the diploma for our seniors and it was a tremendous event a beautiful day a uh, special thank you to Kathy Key and Kathleen Pelesco who joined us for a good portion of the day um, being outside with our seniors it was really a unique opportunity in the sense that uh, they got to walk through their class of 2020 sign that was specially created just for them uh, last year for their junior prom then walk down Algonquin's version of the red carpet, which was actually a little gray, but red enough, and uh, go on to the stage where they picked up their diploma and got their picture taken, all in the midst of honking, beeping, and uh, loud shouts and cheers by their family as they, as they drove along with them as they walked the route and uh, picked up their diploma. So it was a great day. A um, lot of positive feedback from our families in the community and from our seniors. Um, Want to give a special shout out to, to our senior steering committee. Those students have done an amazing job uh, on a challenging year in a challenging year that uh, certainly was something no one expected. Um, they were still able to uh, do the best with what they had and make, make events happen for their senior class. And, and they, uh, they deserve a lot of credit for all the good things that had done. So the next events are uh, June 30th, there'll be a video graduation that Northville Cable Access will be um, sending out. Uh, that again will be June 30th. And then July 30th will be a live graduation ceremony uh, that will be taking place on the football field and more information to come as that date approaches. So a great event though on June 7th. So I, I just make a, a comment uh, through the chair. I just want to thank the uh, AIHS leadership team, Dr. Walsh, um, Mr. McGowan, Mrs. Carmiani, Mr. McDonald, um, Mrs. Capalvo, Angela Mall, Emily Sullivan, the steering committee. They, I don't think they ever want to plan graduation again in a pandemic. I think that's a once in a career, but um, I can't emphasize enough the great job they did, but also the challenge that it was just trying to sort information out to 
identify what we could do safely and um, they did it very well. So I just want to compliment them and thank them for our work. So, um, so I'm going to cry if I start to speak about it. So it was really well done. It was very organized. And I have a video of Ella getting her diploma. So for those who haven't seen it, I would, I'll share it with you if you want. It was just, it was nice. It was, it was, you don't know what to expect when you get there, but then when you go through the process, it was, um, it was good. And the fact that they could do it with subsets of their friends, I think really helped as well, just so they could watch them walk across the stage as well. So thank you for all the organization. And I know it was a long day for everyone. And um, as a parent, it was, I really appreciate it. I'd like to echo Kathy's comments. Um, I've heard some comments from the community members just about how special the diploma event was um, and how well it was planned and how every graduate really did feel special. Um, I've actually heard some people say that they hope that this tradition continues. Um, so um, it, that it was really well done. Um, I wasn't able to make the event, but I was able to watch it via live stream, which I didn't even know was happening. So uh, thank you also for making it accessible to those who couldn't be there in person. Thank you. And yeah, thank you to Northville Cable Access too, who was there the entire time and uh, before and after with with everything. They've been a tremendous support through uh, the whole process with everything senior related. All right. Thank you, Andy. So next in your packet are uh, the enrollments. Um, so we are, there are no significant variances from the last report. Um, and in terms of looking ahead to uh, the fall, um, currently we're at 1,410 students as our projections, but that does um, assume that 100% of current eighth grade students in Southborough and Northborough will attend Algonquin. Just on a, on a side note, um, Keith Lavoie has had conversations with Gary Hershock Trottier around the number of students who will be um, attending private school in the fall from Trottier. And it looks like um, the number is decreasing. As you know, this year we had 20% of our Trottier students attend uh, school, high school elsewhere. And this year we're looking at 10% um, of students at Trottier attending uh, private school. So that number is shifting um, to more students from Trotter attending Algonquin. I have an enrollment question. Probably it's not a, it's more a trend question or have people reached out to you. There's um, quite a few families that are asking about homeschooling options in the fall. Are, are, is Northville or Southborough fielding those type of questions? So we are, um, we are getting a few of those types of questions and Part of our work for reopening the fall will be surveying families around what their plans are um, as they look to the reopening of school. And one of the questions uh, will be, do you plan to homeschool your child in the fall? Yeah, I mean, I know some of the national numbers they're talking is, you know, 20 to 40% of families keeping their kids home. But um, I think we still have a long way to go to find out what the state's gonna tell us before people will make those decisions. Next in your uh, packet is the uh, review of the capital plan. And I believe um, there are no changes since the last um, time the plan was uh, presented to the committee. And just give me one second, I will. Uh, open up the plan. And I'm not sure if there were any specific questions um, about the capital plan at this point in time. So great, uh, through Kathy? Yep, go ahead. So when I look at this uh, screen, we only have two capital projects, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, we have, so in FY21, um, so we had the redundant domestic hot water um, bo boiler, the phone system upgrade, uh, the grounds tractor, the project adventure course, all of those um, are on hold. Um, and then we had in the FY21 column also um, capital improvements for the athletic field, um, 
the track resurface, stadium lighting, tennis courts, and cross country, those are on hold as well. And then if you look down below, um, we have track resurface, $5,000. It's an annual maintenance. Um, again, tennis courts, annual maintenance, um, some door hardware replacement, and gym wall um, mold, uh, modern fold refinish and repair. And lastly, the uh, theater, uh, actually the eyewash infrastructure improvement um, in the science labs. And Greg, I'll just suggest, as you saw at the South Borough town meeting, you know, to be prepared to discuss the, the, the rationale for each and every one of these, why they are in the years that they are, anything that is in this current, uh, you know, coming fiscal year, why it needs to be done now is going to have to be explained. Um, and it should be explained. You're going to have very pointed questions, I will suggest, from residents as to why X hundreds of thousands of dollars need to be, you know, spent now instead of, you know, two, three, five years from now. Absolutely. So that is the uh, review of the capital plan. And as uh, Mr. Kwan indicated, we'll be prepared at town meeting to um, give some details around some of the projects that I propose. Um, next in your packet is the FY20 monthly general fund expenditure report. And I will have um, Becky Pellegrino speak for that report. So as you can see on the monthly general fund report as of May 31st, 2020, um, the district had $621,445 or 2.61 remaining on the bottom line. The finance team has been busy. We continue to clean up our out, any outstanding invoices um, and close purchase orders that are no longer needed. Uh, our plan for the remaining year-end funds is to allocate um, funds up to the 5% allowed in the END uh, account to move money into the regional transportation funds account. And then also departments are purchasing textbook supplies and materials that help to restore, reduce FY21 budget line items. And we will also be um, prepaying for um, FY21 collaborative and private school tuitions as permitted under Mass General Law to again, um, also provide some relief in the FY21 budget. Madam Chair, I would uh, uh, move that we vote to approve until audited. Second. And just a comment on, again on the wonderful job Becky's done on this whole thing. We've put her through hoops and she's come out terrifically well. So mm -hmm. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Paul. Madam Chair, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Kathleen Hallens. Yes. Um, Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. John Frank. Yes. Sean O'Shea. Yes. Lauren Bailey. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. Karen Ayers. Abstain. Right, next Thank you, packet. Becky, by the way. Thank you. So next in your packet is the uh, FY20 statement of revenue. And um, Becky will also talk about uh, transferring um, a vote to transfer regional transportation receipts. So as of the end of May 2020, the district had received the majority of the revenues that we had anticipated for FY20. Um, of note is the state regional transportation reimbursement amount. Um, during FY20, we received additional unanticipated funds in the amount of $72,114. And so tonight we are asking for the school committee, um, for the school committee's approval um, to transfer those funds into the North Gross Alpha Regional School District um, Transportation Fund. And Kathy, if I could, I would move that we vote to transfer regional transportation receipts in the amount of $72,114 to the North Coast South for Regional School District's Transportation Fund. Okay, so the motion is made by Paul Bucca. Second. Okay, second by Joan. Is there any, um, anyone want to say anything? 
This is a terrific idea. <laughs> we should support it. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Uh, Kathleen Halland? Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. John Frank? Yes. John O'Shea? Yes. Lauren Bailey? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Karen, Karen Ayers? Yes, I'll always vote for more money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if I could, I, I think we need to vote on accepting the uh, the statement, the FY20 statement of revenue until audited as well. I will second. All right, so wait. Yep, okay. All right, so that's Paul Bucca motioned. Dan Kalenda, second. Um, all right, Kathleen Halland. Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. John Frank. Yes. Sean O'Shea. Yes. Lauren Bailey. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. Karen Ayers. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, Greg. So we have our treasurer's report. So this evening with us is Christine Kay, who continues to do an outstanding job. Um, so she will give her treasurer's report and then um, the school committee will to, uh, make its annual re re reappointment of uh, Christine Kay as the district treasurer. So welcome, Christine. Hello, all. I hope you can all hear me. <laughs> I had a bit of an issue with um, my uh, Wi-Fi because I'm on my 40-foot boat in North Kingston, Rhode Island. <laughs> Self-quarantine. But anyway, I would like to announce that the rating agency has affirmed our rating at a double A plus. Um, I was somewhat concerned about that rating review when they first contacted me. I've been in this business for over 30 years and have never been through a rating review, review like this after three years of issuing this debt. They were looking because of COVID-19 at the town, the town's ability to pay as well as the region. They were starting to almost segregate the towns from the region as far as the rating review. I was ready to do battle. And I have to say, I commend Greg and his financial staff, which have only been in place for one year. It was the first time I have been told by a rating agency, his name was Christian Richard, Richards, that he could not believe the knowledge we had on the financial statements. Most communities don't even look at their financial statements or their audit. He was very, very impressed with that. And I have to tell you, I was impressed with the team, Greg, did a great job, Becky, myself, because on my watch in 30 years, I've never seen a downgrade and it wasn't gonna happen. So we held, we held the status quo. Given these economic times, they highlighted the fact that, you know, obviously we have two towns that are uh, above normal, in high grade quality, but at the same time, they're looking for the regional school districts to start to hold their own. So I will encourage the school committee to continue to commit money to the e and reserves as well as other reserves, because that seemed to be the forte with the rating agencies. Uh, they want to see us sustain ourselves on our own. Even though Prop 2.5 pays our debt, they still want to see the obligation for the region to pay its own. So, again, I would like to see the district continuing to sustain their reserves in whatever reserves, whether it be through a 
uh, stabilization fund or the out of district stabilization funds, I think that will be very important go forward. While we do not have significant capital projects in the future, the future is still there. So anyway, enough said from me. <laughs> okay, if I could. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, Christina, you know, certainly you've, you've given us great advice in the last couple of years on this whole thing. And it's, it's good to hear the rating agencies uh, are, are responding as, as positively as they have. I mean, you've saved us money. You've, you've given us guidance in ways that um, have helped the taxpayers of, of this district in major ways. And so based on that, I would like to make a motion that we reappoint Christine Tagg as the North Coast Central Regional School District's treasurer from July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021. Second. Can we also um, vote the treasury report in at the same time? Sure, I didn't know. Yeah, do we need to do that? No, so, so I, we're just avoiding uh, voting her reappointment. Oh, perfect, okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, Christine, thank you. I ditto to all of Paul's comments. Um, okay, so to, to reappoint, it was Paul Bucca and then was it Dan? Yes, ma'am. All right, we only have a couple more votes. <laughs> uh, Kathleen Halland? Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Joan Frank? Definitely, yes. And thank you, Christine. Sean O'Shea? Yes. Lauren Bailey? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Karen Ayers? Yes. All right. Can I say one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I want to thank the financial team. They are new, but they are awesome. Becky and Caroline Willett and uh, Michelle LeMay have done an outstanding job. Our cash is reconciled on a timely basis. I'm in awe. <laughs> I'm very happy with them. Well, thank you. And enjoy your time on your boat. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Kathy, could I ask a question? Yeah, Paul, yes. you can. So, Christian, you mentioned uh, continuing to invest in E&D and things like a stabilization fund. I seem to remember we tried to do that at, in Southport anyway a couple of years ago, and town meeting didn't go for it. So, from what I'm hearing, I mean, we don't currently have a stabilization fund. Is that right? No, we don't. And you're right, Paul. Uh, what happened was one town agreed, the other one did not. And as a result, um, it didn't happen. But I think we need to start pushing that because I got to be honest with you, the rating agencies are starting to look towards the regions. Not so much our region because we're only a two school district region, but multiple regions. But anyway, I was really getting concerned because they said, what are you doing outside your E&D to get more stability for the, for the district? Because otherwise we have to rely on the two towns for supplemental appropriations. And that's what they don't want us to have to do. So whatever we can do, you know, to get the towns to agree to a separate stabilization fund would be great. Okay, thank you. I think we need to put that on the radar for, I don't know if we can still do it for the fall town meeting in South Pearl, but if not, then I want after that. But thank you, Well, Christine. maybe not in this, in this time element, given COVID-19. Well, but that's true then, too. Given down the road is all I'm looking at. I'm looking more like next year or the year after. As long as I can say to the agencies, we're looking at these options, you know. I think Christine. Okay. And I will, share, I will share the uh, final review with the school committee. It was so positive. I was so happy. <laughs> Christine, one of the things that just we, we've talked a lot about is just setting up the mechanism of the stabilization account. Even if we're not able to put funds in it, at least we have that, that mechanism and the account set up. So 
we do see funds, um, we could deposit those into that account. Absolutely. Thank you. All. All right. Thank you, Christine. Bye. Bye, Christine. Thank you. Okay. So next in your packet is the FY21 budget calendar. And as Keith shared, the North Road Town meeting is scheduled for July 11th at nine o'clock on the um, Algonquin football field. And um, on this past Saturday, we successfully had the regional assessment approved by the Southboro town meeting. And so we have one more one more obstacle to overcome and, and we're looking forward to um, putting FY21 in, in place and having no, a successful vote at the town, town meeting. So also in your packet is the FY21 school committee approved uh, amended budget. Um, and that is for your reference. And that concludes um, my superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, so there is um, no old business of the time. Um, policy development and distribution. There's um, two policies in our packet um, just for distribution. And next is audience sharing. So just ask that anyone in the audience who would like to share, um, you can just uh, type in the chat and then I will uh, promote you to a panelist. While we're waiting for that, uh, I have something I'd like to share. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, as of yesterday, um, our colleague Dan Kalender is, is no longer a selectman in Southboro and after nine years, I believe, and at least from the Southboro continued, I'd like to pass along our, our thanks to him for, for nine years of service on, on the selectman. I don't know how you did it through, doing that board as well as this one, but uh, I'm glad you did. So thanks yeah, a lot, yeah. Dan. Yeah. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Dan. Thank you. I wonder sometimes too. So, but thank you. It means <laughs> we, none of us do this for uh, any financial gain for sure. Uh, we give up our time. We give up our evenings. We give up family time to do this. And uh, everyone on this, on this Zoom is doing the exact same thing. So thank you, Paul. But, uh, you know, honestly, you know, we all are doing the same thing. I applaud everyone on this call. So uh, I appreciate that. And you can do all your free time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hundreds of hours of extra free time. <laughs> Kathy? Yep. That, uh, uh, for the Northboro contingent, I think I can speak that we all appreciate Dan's expertise and uh, his dedication and making sure that he still came, attended the meetings, even though he was double duty by being the selectman. But thank you for all your. Uh, expertise in our region and also on the selectmen and the two towns working together. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we, it was a, a great day uh, yesterday. Uh, democracy spoke and, and a number of people got reelected, which is absolutely wonderful. And there's actually a new addition. Uh, and uh, Dan Budka joins uh, the volunteer field of, uh, on Asset Valley. And that was wonderful to see him do a write-in, uh, you know, be a write-in candidate. Uh, I love, absolutely love seeing um, our younger residents want to volunteer and give of themselves and their time uh, to make their communities a better place to live. And, you know, kudos to, uh, you know, the, the Budka family and raising wonderful children who are following in their, in their mom and dad's business. <laughs> Congratulations to Dan. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Dan. That was nice of you to say. Congratulations to your son, Dan, um, Paul. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, Kathy, we have one audience um, person who would like to share. It's um, Mary Rice the Foss. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Mary. Can you? Hi. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Um, and. How are you all? Good. 
So you're all set to. Yes. Um, what is the format exactly? <laughs> so if, um, Mary, if you want to share, um, you know, your information, that'd be excellent. Okay. So um, with this group, um, uh, let's see. Uh, I am uh, uh, an Algonquin graduate. I am presently, um, currently a, a professor of French and Francophone studies at Bates College in Maine. Uh, I also teach in programs in uh, American studies and Africana. And um, I wrote to you uh, about the petition to change uh, the name of the school. And um, because I uh, have a certain point of view on it because although I have white skin privilege, um, I, uh, I am also of Native American heritage uh, and, and an Algonquin tribe, the Narragansett. And um, I find that the petition itself is um, idealistic and uh, well-intentioned, but uh, at the same time, I think that there are lots of parts of that petition that are um, kind of wrongheaded. Uh, uh, I, there, one of the things that bothers me the most about the petition to change the name of the school is that the writers tend to talk about Native Americans as them. And so they create a binary of us versus them uh, without taking into consideration that there are people in North Pro and South Pro who have Native American heritage. Um, so that dichotomy of us versus them, they seem to think, for example, uh, let's see if I can have the quote. The, uh, they, they say that the name Algonquin was stolen from the tribe and they act as if uh, uh, it, it's a kind of a trademark to be bought and sold. And I'd like to elaborate on that in a minute, but I wanted to point out that um, not all Native Americans live on reservations, particularly in the Northeast. The people of Native American heritage are part of mainstream society, but this isn't just in the Northeast, it's, it's nationwide. Um, the petitioners then, they, they seem to other uh, Native Americans. They're not us, they're uh, them. And um, I'm here, we exist. In fact, I can name about four or five people from my own time at Algonquin who had Native American heritage. And some of them stayed in the local area. They uh, had children who went to Algonquin and their grandchildren are now in the local schools. Uh, whether they'll be at Algonquin or not, it depends, they're still very young. Um, I was the valedictorian of the class of 1974. I'm a part of the we of Algonquin, of, the, of alums and current students. Um, but at the same time, I'm not, according to this petition, I'm somebody who is other. And that's not true. Um, and what I think is the problem is that there's a conflation of the name, the mascot or the tomahawk and maybe some behaviors surrounding what happens at sports events. Um, let's see. I, I think of uh, the name Algonquin as in Native American terms, for example, not as a trademark, but um, Native Americans use names to tell stories about a place. And for, uh, for uh, the name Algonquin, I think it tells the story that there were peoples who spoke Algonquian languages uh, in Northboro, in, in what are now Northboro and Southboro, long before any colonial settlers ever arrived. And um, to change the name is, a, is an act of erasure. It's making something that should be visible, invisible. Um, and I think that the petitioners don't see that. 
they, because they, they are tied up in other issues that involve uh, the name of the tomahawks and um, uh, maybe some of the cultural appropriation that's been going on at games or whatever. Um, I think that this is a teachable moment. I'm an educator and uh, I think that I, you know, there are, there are many, many Facebook posts about this petition, both for and against. Uh, but I think that it would be really important instead of changing the name to maybe add some course content that deals with the heritage of place. Um, there are amazing stories uh, about um, the interactions between colonial settlers in what was then Marlboro. And, you know, to get some sort of an understanding of those interactions, I think is really important. That's basically what I wanted to say. I think opening up a dialogue is far richer than just erasing our past. And it's a shared past. Uh, so that's, that's what I had to say. Thank you, Mary, very much for coming on. I know I read your email and, um, mm -hmm. and I found it very insightful. I mean, it's something that I, you know, work on as, as a professor, you know, I, I work on the construction of cultural identities and on issues of uh, social justice and equity. And I'm just hoping that you'll see a, a path that threads a needle that that, you know, the name doesn't necessarily have to go in order to open up this dialogue about how do we avoid inappropriate behaviors. So well, thank you for um, hearing your opinion. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any questions of me or I know you've had a very long meeting, so I don't want to. So because so because this particular item was not on our agenda, we can't ask questions. Um, oh, okay. We can listen to you know what you have to say, but um, we're hoping to meet with the petition, the people who wrote the petition, and sure. um, and sit down and have you know a good a good convers a teachable conversation with them. That's great. I mean, they're clearly idealistic. They're clearly their hearts are in the right place, but I think that they're conflating a lot of different kinds of issues. Right. And, and one of those issues is an erasure. You know, they, they want to, you know, just eliminate the name. And I, I'm a little troubled that um, on Facebook, there was some reference to uh, being embarrassed about going to a school that's named Algonquin. And I don't think that that, I think that stems from a, a certain ignorance and a certain um, uh, tendency to not want to address issues of race. Um, to rather uh, focus on, you know, themselves and on whiteness, but not to talk about anything, not to talk about uh, racial difference uh, and so on. So, right. Well, again, thank you for um, giving us your opinion. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. And um, good luck with the rest of your meeting. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, Actually, so, I actually have audience sharing if okay yep go ahead so um I have something that is sort of related to, to Mary's um so I do have like a one minute um just statement I'd like to make um so I think it would be remiss um to fail to mention the Black Lives Matter protests happening recently across oh. our country and also in our communities um so the past few weeks as our nation has been grappling with the deaths of George Floyd Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery um, a spotlight has highlighted the systemic racism that's intertwined in pretty much every aspect of our daily lives. Um, so as a school community that is predominantly white, the reality is that our community has so much more to learn about systemic racism, microaggressions, and the whitewashing of curricula. One of our goals as a school committee and as a school community is to graduate students who are ready to face the world with the skills, tools, and intellect to treat all people with respect, stand up for what they believe in, and add positive change to the world in which they live. Without a conscious effort by our school community to include conversations, lessons, and experiences that will help our students grow into anti-racist individuals, our school community is not doing all we can to support our students. 
So conversations about race, inclusivity, and tolerance are already taking place in many of our classrooms, especially in the Algonquin elective history class, Race in America. It makes the most sense to talk about racism in history classes, but I believe that teaching about racism can't just fall on the backs of our history teachers. There are places and times in every classroom to learn about and discuss important issues such as these. So my call here tonight is one of action. I'm honestly not entirely sure what that action would look like. It could be a curriculum review, focus groups with students, a study into how other communities have Im implemented um, these conversations about race into their curriculum and into their classrooms. Um, and maybe it's just starting the conversation by asking the question, what more can we do to educate our students about the injustices of systemic racism in our country? So regardless of how we proceed, I really hope that our district makes ourselves uncomfortable as we dive into the necessary conversations about race in our country and also in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, again, because it's not on our agenda, we, I can't, we can't go further than that, but I do, but I appreciate that. Um, does anyone else have anything? Um, so our next is personnel. You have the distri distribution of the personnel report. Um, and Sean Habevin, principal, will be getting uh, his work as a principal of Algonquin Regional High School on July 1. Um, and we have Emma, uh, chemistry teacher, um, effective August 31st, a great hire, and then a leave of absence. Um, and then Kara team our retirement who's been an administrative assistant effective and her retirement's effective June 30th so we wish Carol well and then lastly we have Jen Henry who um, was a district-wide DCBA and she is our early childhood coordinator um, for the public schools of North Pearl and South Pearl she so she remains with us just in a different role. Uh, Kathy I have a question for Greg. Yep. Um, Greg, I recently saw that there's an open position at Algonquin for a choral position. Um, is that an addition to um, a current position or is it a replacement? So it's, um, we had an unexpected um, opening at Algonquin. We had um, a longstanding choral teacher who um, is uh, moving across country for uh, family reasons. And we are, we have posted that position to uh, fill her shoes in in her role as a music teacher at Algonquin. Thank you. I think she'll be sorely missed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, communications. So we have um, a Northboro Board of Selectmen proclamation. And if I can find it. So I can't find it, but I have it here on my desk. So, um, so basically the, the town of North from Massachusetts, the, um, the select board issued a proclamation um, to our Algonquin Regional High School seniors. And I'll just read it into record. So it's whereas the month of June is traditionally the month when high school graduation occurs across the nation. And whereas the high school graduating class of 2020 has experienced the dramatic interruption of their educational and social lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic and, whereas graduating seniors at the Algonquin Regional High School and Ascot Valley Regional Technical High School have worked hard to graduate despite the challenges of completing the school year in virtual classrooms and, whereas these young individuals have had to give up so many things that make high school memorable sports, field trips, theatrical performances, concerts, club activities, social activities, and graduation ceremonies. And whereas Northboro High School seniors have overcome these disappointments and have demonstrated their commitment to education and their faith in the future. And whereas the class of 2020 graduates deserve their achievements to be recognized by the people within their community and beyond. We now therefore proclaim the month of June, 2020, Northboro High School Seniors Month. So, and that's signed 
uh, by the select board members. So I think it was a nice, a nice gesture on the board of uh, selecting. That's really nice. I like that. Um, okay, the next is approval of bills and payroll. I think we're all set with that, right? Correct. And um, agenda items for next month. So we do have to have a July meeting because um, Northboro doesn't have their election until next week. So um, Greg is gonna, we're gonna try to do a, a doodle poll to find a date that works in July. So um, the agenda items are the election of officers, um, the, two, two, the 2020-2021 subcommittee assignments, and also um, Lauren to your um, statement, I actually think it makes sense to um, to put a, um, a group together, a working group to figure out, you know, what we can do um, to make our students more aware um, of what's going on in the world today. And my daughter actually took Race in America and thought that that would be such a great class for every kid to take, mm -hmm. um, as well as Silent Voices, which is another great class that, um, that she thinks that every kid would be, you know, should sign up for just because it makes you aware of what's going on and it, and it, and you have conversations, you know, about, and it's a difficult, they're difficult conversations. So I think as a school committee, it would make sense um, at some point to put a board together, a working board to figure out what, um, what we can do. And Kathy, I would just encourage you and others. I mean, there are lots of topics that each individual student 1500 students would like every other student to be aware of and to know about. So I don't know where this goes or where it stops, but we have to be mindful of there are 1500 students, all of whom probably have different ideas, different thoughts on things that they wanna make sure that everyone in the community understands about them, their situation, the world, you know, so it's, I think- no, we I, I agree, yeah. So we gotta be just, I would, I think we be just careful. have to be careful about, you know, one student says everyone needs to, to do mm -hmm. X. You know, we got to be mindful of that. We have 1,500 students who may want 1,500 other students to do X. Kathy, I think we need to put that on the agenda and create a working group too. I agree. I think Greg said it well in his letter to the community. I think, um, I, I think there needs to be an opportunity to review um what's what messages and what the curriculum is what materials are and what are implicit and explicit um uh communications being given to students and and how the, the most important thing is for kids to be able to critically think and they need to be aware of uh, themselves and others um not just about what's happening in the world, but about themselves and how they think and examine themselves. And I think we, we you know, owe it to our, our community. We can't teach about everything, you know, every minute thing, but we can teach to problem solving, cultural proficiencies and understanding like thinking processes and, and what's, uh, and how to examine different sides of issues. So I, I think whatever form that takes, I think it, we owe it to the students um, to, to start a, a dialogue and, and a review process. Um, and, and again, I think Greg, you said it well in your letter uh, about your own uh, leadership team doing the same. And Greg, you may need to address this right now, it sounds like. So I don't think your message uh, to the community was meant in any way to state that Algonquin um, has some you know, major issues that it has to deal with and that we live in communities that are uh, not tolerant of others and that are, you know, uh, that, that our students are, uh, you, you know, racist in, in, in any way that our administration is uh, not tolerant of all races, religions, uh, backgrounds, ethnicities. Uh, I don't think that was in any way what your message sought to, uh, uh, to, to promote. So, you may need to address this right now because it sounds like this conversation is going in a different way that there is something dramatically wrong in Northboro and Southboro that needs to be fixed. I mean, I think that um, 
at our next combined meeting, we have the strategic plan, the reauthorization of the strategic plan. And part of the work to come to that, uh, that document was really thinking about what is the portrait of a graduate? You know, when, when our students leave our organization, Algonquin, what types of citizens do we want to create and develop? You know, citizens who can um, advocate, who have a sense of agency, who can problem solve, who can think critically, who are empathetic, um, who are caring and kind. Those attributes and that work is, un is not unique to the work that has, has been in place at Algonquin for, for many years. There's always work um, in terms of helping students understand the world around them, whether it's the cultural diversity or linguistic diversity. And that's part of the work that we need to do. In terms of evaluating curriculum and, and looking at um, what we can do better, the beauty about education is that you're never done. The work is never done. There's always work to be, to be improved upon. I do not, did not in my letter ever want to indicate that I thought that, um, to Dan's point, that I thought there was systemic issues around racism. There is work to be done um, in developing understanding, helping our students understand the world around them. Um, so, you know, and that was my point. And we need to look inward and outward. Um, and part of that is beginning with looking at the curriculum, looking at experiences students have, entering into dialogue and, and discourse with, with our faculty and staff, um, and, and continuing the work of improving the experiences our students have. And just to piggyback off of what Greg said, I think it's worth noting to the committee that um, that dialogue has already started, though school ended uh, yesterday. We've already started dialogue, and uh, Kathy Carmignani has led that effort with uh, a number of students involved and in, in, uh, kind of the, the activities going on outside of school in the town of North Row and South Row. So that dialogue has already started. Kathy, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Sure. Thank you, Andy. Um, we, I was able to reach out to those students that had um, organized the rally in Northborough and just congratulated, congratulated them and then offered them the ability to continue that conversation with us at Algonquin. And they were thrilled to have that opportunity. And we met this past Monday. Um, they had really done a lot of great work and talked about what they wanted to see at the school. And they talked about curriculum changes they might want or um, just changes that we may need to think about with discipline. And so, um, you know, we, we're gonna continue that conversation. We have, we're bringing some more people to the table. We have the uh, department chairs from the English department and the social studies department in our next meeting, um, as well um, as all of the administration in, um, for the school. So that, that way we really, we're really, everyone's listening and we're having a great conversation and we're moving forward. I could chime in here. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I totally agree with Greg and, and uh, Lauren and John that this is is an issue that we, we need to look at. And, and frankly, I fully expected to do it anyway, even before, uh, you know, all the unrest in the last couple of weeks, as Greg said, having been involved in the portrait of a graduate and the, and the whole strategic planning process, it was clear that that was going to drive some curriculum changes anyway. So I think it's just continuing that discussion. So just the last comment, I think that um, obviously this this topic uh, needs its own agenda item. Um, yep. And although it wasn't on the agenda uh, for this evening, um, you know, I think I think Kathy, you had mentioned um, adding it as an agenda item, or maybe Sean. So, and then really having a deeper dialogue if it's the will of the committee around, you know, what is it exactly um, that we're, we're doing um, in terms of moving the work forward and developing uh, cultural competency uh, in our faculty and staff. And the other thing is, it's also an opportunity 
to talk about all the work that was well underway um, prior to the events over the past month that um, the development of empathy and tolerance and inclusion and equity were conversations that, that faculty and staff at Algonquin and throughout the district and the leadership team have been engaged in, um, not because of a reaction to um, current events, because it's, it's ongoing work that we have engaged in and we will continue to engage and potentially will accelerate some of that work. But this is not a new conversation and a new topic for um, the faculty and staff and the leadership team. Um, and there was work to be done. And I think that's a great point, Greg. And if when you find things where that are deficient, I trust that you and the administration root that out immediately. That is accurate. So do we want to add this to our July meeting? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Does anyone else have anything else to add to it? If you do, if anyone has anything, just you can email me. Um, so we have our last motion. Dan. So moved. <laughs> so a motion to adjourn. So Dan Kalenda, do I have a second? Second. All right, Paul Desmond. Just think about this. We only have two more meetings to do this at. So <laughs> I'm not sure if you're the most excited about the July meeting. <laughs> All right, Kathleen Halland. Yes. Kathy Key, yes. Paul Bucca left. Um, Paul Desmond. Yes. John Frank. Yes. Sean O'Shea. Yes. Lauren Bailey. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. Karen Ayers. Yes. All right, guys. Have a uh, have a great right. weekend. Happy Father's Day to all of you guys. Is this, is this Lauren's last meeting with us, or oh, does wait, she Lauren, continue? I think I'll be. Well, I'll be at the combined meeting, right next week. So thank you for um, joining yeah, thank you. the past like few months. It's been nice having you. It's been really nice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Lauren. Let's have a walk. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Bye. -bye. Good night. Good night.